Some of you are familiar with some of the names, we'll call them the great scholars and theologians and contributors to our understanding of the faith. We'll be familiar with the name J.C. Riley. He once said, I pity the man who never thinks about heaven. I love that quote, but I would probably want to rewrite it just slightly in light of our current series and maybe um, put emphasis on I pity individual who does not probe and mind the depths to understand, not just think about, but to understand and truly do the work we're doing to have a clear picture. And I really do think the vast majority of people, but specifically the vast majority within Christendom, they don't actually have a clue. They don't. I'm not saying that to be mean. I'm saying that because I've asked over, this is, I believe, message number eight, I think, but over the last few weeks, I've been meeting people and asking people just random questions that, you know, what's your take on this? What are your thoughts on that? And it is kind of staggering to hear the things that people say on this subject specifically. And I have made reference to this before, so I want to make sure that I'm not coming across as someone who's being critical of others. I'm saying this because I feel like this, um, this series and subjects like this series are so radically important. If we say we are Christians, what separates the Christian from people who aren't Christians? Well, the first thing is our identification with Christ. And if your starting point of who Christ is is skewed or not clear, as you travel down the road of faith, if you will, with erroneous ideas or erroneous thoughts of who Christ is and his work and his finished work, you're going to have some problems with end time events, death, dying, heaven, hell, who is in control of what, what is actually happening to dead people now that are dead, departed ones, departed today, yesterday, last year, 20 years ago, 100 years ago, and the thing that we need to be contemplating because ultimately mortality is a disease that will essentially affect every human being. So we need to educate ourselves. And, and this could change the landscape for many people. As I've said before, if you go to a funeral, if you go to a Christian funeral, I understand grief and I understand missing your, your loved ones. You'll never have another earthly mother or father. You'll never have another spouse or brother, sister. So when, especially when I have either officiated or I've been uh, as a guest and someone who wants to pay their respects to friends and family of the deceased, I'm always shocked to see people's reactions. As I said, I understand grief. I'm not saying that we should be Stoics, but if we really have a clear vision of what happens to the Christian at death, there should be a great load that is taken off, like a weight that's taken off of our back or shoulders, and there should be something lifted which most people, even Christians, tend to grapple with, which is the fear of the unknown. What will happen? Or better yet, think of it this way. We live our whole lives, and we're kind of indoctrinated with this. Estate planning. Make, you, know, you have to make all of your wishes known, which most people should do. You should write a will. That's your last word when you, you're already in the grave. You get a final word here, which could, I have all kinds of interesting images of what that could play out to be. I, I can't help it. I remember, <laughs> you know where I'm going. <laughs> Some of you are, yeah, I, I, think, I think you're going to tell the story. I remember Dr. Scott telling the story about this reading of the will. And then they all gathered and they were all, they were all rubbing their hands, waiting to see what was going to happen. And it turned out that each individual named in the will left a penny, left a penny, just to make sure that they knew that they weren't forgotten. <laughs> but you get, you, that's the only time you really get to play God is when you write your last will. Those are your wishes that are to be carried out. But what is perplexing is when I say this, to see so much lack of understanding. Ultimately, as I said, if you make a will, it's because you want to distribute your earthly possessions or you want certain things done after you're gone. But imagine, and this is what we, I don't think very many of us think about this, 
we spend a lifetime accumulating or trying to accumulate or just trying to exist and maybe, maybe putting aside a little crumb. We plan to disperse whatever it is we have when we leave. And usually the thought is with great finality. In other words, these things I bequeath, they should be distributed. This is what will happen because I'm not coming back here anymore. Well, guess what? That's wrong. You are coming back. You just won't be back in the state you were in. And when you do come back, and when I do come back, there are certain things we won't have to think about. I had this interesting question last week, early in the week. Somebody asked, because I'm talking about new heavens and new earth, what's going to happen in the end of days that will be the culmination that brings about the new earth. And um, two things that were asked of me. One is, will we have gender? When we get glorified bodies, will we have gender? And I thought, that's an excellent question. And here's my answer to you. If you were a female in this lifetime, and you would walk the earth as a female, you will be a female in the new earth. And if you were born a male, and you lived your life as a male, you will come back as a male. And this is very important for a current discussion on people who change their gender or decide to, to be other than what they were born. These concepts, sorry, this is not a judgment on people's personal decision. This is an actuality. What you were when you were brought into being is what you will be when you come back. Sorry, that's the way the book goes. That's not my planning. That's God's provision. Why? Because he said, let us make man or Adam in our image. So the image that we will come back in is the image that we were created in, not something else. People think maybe we'll have special cherubic bodies or whatever, um, which brings the next thing. If there's gender, this is a, I'm going to make this a PG and then I'll get into my message. If there is gender, the next question that was asked of me is, will people be intimate? And I will answer that later. <laughs> All right. See, I know how to, I know how to get you carnal people hooked because <laughs> I'm hooked too. <laughs> All right, so we'll, we'll come back. It's important, though. You see, something interesting is happening for me, because I tend to say this in a, the, the broadest sense. There are preachers out there, pastors, ministers, priests, rabbis, who spend the bulk of their time condemning people in this lifetime for their sexual preferences, orientation, whatever it is that they deem as wrong. That's not my calling. My calling is to teach you what God's book says, and you take the information, as I've said over and over again, and you and God work it out. If you think it's a sin, then it's a sin, don't do it. But why I, I just put this in as a footnote about gender is a lot of people are confused and, and think that whatever we would like ourselves to be or how we envision ourselves is what we will be. But that essentially says that I can play God, I am essentially God by designating what God has designed and saying, this is how I want it to be. But this is what God says. If you were brought into the world this way, you will come back this way. And failure to acknowledge that God is deciding, not you. There's where, that's an interesting line that you have to work out. It's not me. I'm not condemning any individual. It's something you have to work out. If God says, this is how I'm going to take you, the way you came is the way you're coming back needs to be solved by people in the now who are grappling with this. If they don't consider the spiritual aspect of it, then I guess spirituality and the things of God are not that important, and you make your, you make your choices. Uh, but I said, as mine is to put the information out there, and I just said a mouthful. So for those people who vacillate on what they should think about this, it, it is what it is, and God's very plain about this. So during the course of this series, I hope to clear up some of those greatly confusing things as we get into the New Testament out of the words of Jesus himself, which actually there we've got a clear shot. There's really no ambiguity. So we'll be looking at that, and we'll, I am going to tackle some of the things that I'm sure most of us think about but probably don't want to utter. So I, I'm, I'll do it for you, okay? And I'll, I'll, when, it, when it's my turn to stand, I'll say, God, I had to ask these questions in front of everybody because everybody else was thinking them. So I'll be your fall person. But I think what happens, and I'm just almost done with my introduction here, is 
we get into a myopic view of eternity. And that, as I said, can be tainted by our upbringing, by our denominational affiliation, or a myriad number of other things, including people in olden days reading something like Dante's work. Believe it or not, many of the ancients were greatly influenced, even though not necessarily believers, greatly influenced by Dante's work. So it's important to kind of cover all the areas, debunk the things that do not belong. Last week's attempt at talking about purgatory was simply ideas put out. I don't think that you can cover that subject in an hour. You probably can't cover it in a lifetime if you were going to start debunking and putting scripture as the proof text, not one, but multiple scriptures that then become doctrine. So there are some interesting dynamics. I also want to say one more footnote. Some of you are big C.S. Lewis fans, and I, I would tell you, as I mentioned him last week, and I said something of a commentary on his, maybe what he said or didn't say. C.S. Lewis never professed to be a theologian of sorts, if you would call somebody like Spurgeon or one of those, Bishop Mool or something like that. C.S. Lewis, as he came to the faith, began to write, and the principles that he put out, we could say, touch on theology, they touch on philosophy, they touch on many different areas. So I don't, I think there are subjects which he did not exhaust or he didn't touch on specifically, or in some cases, like my reference last week, uh, it's either out of um, Letters to Malcolm, screw tape letters, or one other. It might be The Problem of Pain. He makes a reference, and it, it leans very much towards a, um, we'll call it Anglican. I, don't, I can't call it quite Catholic. It's really not quite Anglican either interpretation. And unless you're familiar with an understanding where the dividing theological lines are between Anglican and Catholic, and as you go down the line, you can then see where his theology might fit in. Of course, I, I say Anglican absolute, but it may even be more like Anglican light with influences of some Catholicism in there. So don't use that as a template. It's, his writings are brilliant. They are designed for the young reader as well as the older reader, but don't make that uh, theological treatise on any one subject spread the love around and investigate, use your mind, and use the tools that I've mentioned. Now, back to trying to lay the foundation to get into the message. Many times here we've studied in the book of Isaiah, looking at Satan's, we'll call it his fall, I like to sometimes call it eviction, and we see the attitude that is revealed within the Old Testament specifically, how Satan viewed after the fall a sense of detesting God or a sense of challenging God or a sense of desire to destroy. That's why one of his names, Apollyon, destroyer, desire to destroy the things of God. But how, this is how I want to kind of plant the seed for this message. How do you think if he fell from heaven or better yet, I like the word evicted. I just like that word for Satan. It just sounds so good. He is a liar from the beginning, accuser of the brethren. He's the father of lies. So what would be better to try and taint the minds of people who possibly could come to the faith if Satan is so bitter that he does not have the home he once had? Why should you have his home? In other words, you've got to look at this from not just a God perspective. God says, I'm preparing this place for you almost as a restoration of what was intended to be, Satan's mindset is, I will keep as many people from entering. Now, the cool thing is the Bible says Satan, being referred to as the God of this world, small g, the God of this world that has blinded the minds of people, specifically, if you talk to people who are simply not open to the faith, they're not open to Christ, they're not open to hearing about any of these things, we're not just talking about those people who may just be completely spiritually blind, but there are other people who their mind has been blinded to the subject, for example, um, when I talk about forgiveness. How many times have I heard people say, well, that's for somebody else, but it's not for me. I've been too bad. There's another blinding work of Satan. But there is 
the greatest work that I find as I'm investigating this subject, which is the less we know about where we're going, the happier Satan is. Because if we don't know what lies ahead, it, it becomes a mystery. It's a field of unknownness that we cannot possibly fathom. We don't even press the subject. So happy, happy are the invisible forces around us. And for some people who don't believe in the devil, you might think I'm a complete nut talking about this. But happy is the one who is desiring to keep as many away from God coming to him, but more than that, to keep those who would want to know or at least have a curiosity to know in the state of cartoon or caricature versus reality. And in asking the questions, as I said in the last couple of weeks, what shall we do in heaven? What will heaven be like? Who will be in heaven? If there's no time, for example, and you read in Revelation where it says the elders are going around the throne singing or those creatures that are going around the, where the 24 elders are sitting on thrones singing holy, 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 that must be an unending song. I mean, if you think about it, now bear with me as I have to do a little caricature myself. It just seems appropriate that if you've ever been put on hold <laughs> for an indefinite period of time, and you get the Muzak version of Girl from Ipanema, and you just don't want to hear it anymore, and it's like, oh, my, right? You can't just, like, you're about to explode. You won't have that reaction to holy, holy, holy. Why? Because in, the, in his presence, it will be unending joy. It's not like, oh, when is this over? There's no time. You're not thinking about how to rush through this thing. It's pure worship, which, by the way, we never experience down here, never. We, we may come close to it, but we never experience that which those individuals being referenced in the book of Revelation experience. So there are all these things that I will address, but as I said, it, it's important to kind of put these things in proper perspective. So in our search for understanding, in our search to circumvent the wiles of the devil and those who have um, maybe taken on erroneous ideologies, we're going to go back to the book, and we're once again going to look at sections of the Bible and the Old Testament that might help us a little bit with a few key words and concepts. So I take you today to the book of Daniel, and if you are turning to the book of Daniel in the second chapter, and kind of, I kind of have to backtrack a little bit because people who are not familiar will say, you just jumped in here and you're kind of leaving me in the middle of nowhere. I don't know where I am. Well, Daniel has already interpreted or will interpret King Nebuchadnezzar's dream, and he goes through the parts. He sees this statue with various medals throughout, and Daniel goes on to explain to King Nebuchadnezzar what these parts mean. And as he gets down, going through from head down to the toes, you have to read this and kind of be a little bit baffled, because if... Daniel's interpretation of the statue of the vision in Nebuchadnezzar's dream represent kingdoms, successive kingdoms, their rise and their fall, then going on to the next kingdom, and these are historical and traceable. Then in verse 44 of the second chapter, and in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. Now, somebody reading this cursory will say, you know, okay, you're, give the interpretation of kingdom and territory, kingdom and territory. And we're talking about kingdoms and rulers that historically we can chronicle them. And Daniel just jumps to an end time, something at the end that will be forever. And that's a first piece of information that is extremely important. I, I want to put this in here because you will hear me reference this in future messages on this subject. When it says, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. In the New Testament, you're going to have Jesus talk about, in parabolic methods, the kingdom of, of heaven is like an unto, and one of them starts with the kingdom of heaven is like an unto, a, ki a certain king. So I don't want us to ever get to the point of thinking that when the word kingdom is being used, which is tossed around so frequently in churches, kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom, you can't have a kingdom without a king. Now, I want you to take the idea of kingdom, king, and country and 
take it all the way to the end because at the end there will not be, we will not have the type of rulers on earth that we have suffered through the ages. There will be one ruler on earth in the new earth. We will live in the midst of the king. We will live in his presence. That is an amazing concept considering that most of this book tells you that in his presence when people encountered Jesus or God, they, they thought death was going to be their lot. To see God would mean, to see, to behold God would mean you'd have to die. We will behold him always. He will be in our midst. He will, when we say he will rule and reign, I want you to think about in a future time, there won't be any, oh God, there won't be any Washington as we know it. Hallelujah. All right. It's the first time I said that in a long time. Wait. See, I'm looking forward to the new heaven and the new earth because the first thing I, I'd love for God to do is just, you know, God, if you were going to do some miracles like in the, in the Old Testament, you know, I'm talking about certain plagues or something, send it over there. Do, do a display over there. <laughs> and, you know, maybe we'd all pay more attention. But anyway, back to, <laughs> back to the book. So kingdom... Definitely, I want it to be clear that kingdom always is talking about where there's a kingdom, there's a king. So, again, how could, how could Daniel use this? And I know it's, it, it's not a stretch, it's just something to really consider. First of all, how could Daniel understand and know? It was given to him to understand the mysteries of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. But more importantly... He was living in a kingdom at the time and got deported to Babylon. Such a foreign concept to, to talk about a kingdom that was not yet. Even that is mind-boggling. You, know, you might say, well, okay, that's not a big deal. But when you start reading this, it becomes a big deal. Now, again, if you keep reading with me in Daniel's book here, I'm going to take us to the seventh chapter because that's really where I want to start because I just mentioned about kingdom. So remember I said to you from chapter 7 through 12, we, we have more prophetic, and you've got to take the interpretations, which is not my message today. So if you're wondering, if you start reading Daniel and you're wondering what do these things mean, what do these kingdoms and these beasts and all these animals mean, please go to the network. We might have some posted as videos on demand. If not, there are titles all over the place that explain all of this. I don't want to get into it today because it's, that's its own subject, and it's important to understand that, but that's not my motive today, so try and stay with me as, as to where I'm going. But from the seventh chapter forward, we've got the mentioning of the four beasts, and then what we pick up, if you read with me in verse 9, so seventh chapter, verse 9, I, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was head like pure wool, his throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels a burning fire. And the fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand, thousands ministered unto him. Ten thousand times, ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set. The books were open. And I ask you to stop right there. How could this person writing in, well, I'm going to, my memory's not too sharp here, but I'm going to say somewhere in the 500s, five five somethings BC. How could he know that thousands of thousands will be before him? The judgment was set and the books were open. Essentially, and he's referring to the books which we've got reference to in the back, further on, like the front of the book and the back of the book, to the book of life. The books were open. The books that record every living creature's acts, not just on that bad day, but every day. Now we talk about capacity for memory. There are things that people have really got upside down. God's going to look at everything. When it says the books were open, God's going to look at it all. He's, he's going to look at my life and he's going to look at your life. And this is the wonder of it all. It, it really is something beyond comprehension when in this whole section there is, actually the whole book is a depiction of good and evil and ultimately the culmination of what will happen to the evil and what will happen to the good. And Daniel spells it out clearly. So 
The first thing here is this thousands of thousands ministered unto him, 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The judgment was set, the books were open. Let me keep reading. I beheld then because of the voice of the, of the great words which the horn spake. People who are not familiar with this are going to say, what are you talking about? As I said, please find the teaching somewhere else. Let me read through this and explain what I need to point to for my message. I beheld even till the beast was slain, his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. If you know the book of Revelation, you know what this is referring to. And that's why I said you cannot read this book in isolation. Revelation, Ezekiel, probably some other books that I would supplement with at least some few references to build this up and make a cohesive total. As concerning the rest of the beast, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. Now, Daniel will keep mentioning the Ancient of Days, the Son of Man, and these are none other than messianic terms and references to God, the Son of God. There's, there's nothing that's ambiguous about this. So what is important? The concepts that Daniel lays out, the interpretation, and the interpretation of what I just read, if you read in the verses that come, 26 and 27, but the judgment shall sit, they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end, and the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole, under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. I ask again, how does Daniel know this? How is this possible? Because everything that's being said, although in, in areas it might be cryptic, are all confirmed as events that will either have unfolded or are yet to unfold and are confirmed with the prophecies, other prophecies from other writers yet to unfold. Which brings me to something that he says about the coming one. That's back there in uh, verse 13 and 14 of the seventh chapter. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Now, I want you to take everything that I've said over the last seven weeks and start building a picture. If Daniel was given some dimensions of these, what we're going to call them pictures of a future time. They're not just vignettes, they're actual pictures with understanding. Thousands of thousands worshiping at the, at the throne of the king. Sounds to me very much like something that we will eventually get to both out of Matthew and Revelation, which one has to come to this conclusion, which might change the way we worship down here, the way we think down here. But all of this is pointing to a kingdom. And I'm going to say this again because it's worth repeating. A kingdom requires there be a king. And when the king shall rule, he, he currently is sitting at the right hand of God, but when he shall rule here, it's not as though some will and some won't. The idea that is being put down here, 10,000, thousands, the, the vast multitudes of people worshiping him are not dead people, by the way. They're very much alive because dead people are dead. They're not alive. They're dead in, in their state they're in. Their bodies are dead. These are people who are very much alive and worshiping. So when people talk about, will we be bored in the future? The answer is, hell no. <laughs> Just thought I'd say that. Now, what are the consequences to all this? And I'm doing this, again, I don't want you to think this particular message is exhaustive. It is not. It may be exhausting, but it's not exhaustive. In that, I'm trying to give you some, they're more, we'll call them fodder for thought on Daniel's understanding, what was revealed to him. So I take you to the 12th chapter, because in the 12th chapter, you've got essentially the consequences that are spelt out. Now, the 12th chapter opens with something that will require us to go back a few verses back into the 11th chapter, so let me say it right now. 12th chapter, and at that time shall Michael stand up the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. 
And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Now let me stop right there and say that this is an expression that Daniel uses a lot. At that time, at the appointed time, the time of trouble, but specifically now I'm talking about at that time. If you go back and you read, say, beginning at, I'm just taking this as an example, verse 35 of the 11th chapter, and some of them of understanding shall fall, try them, and to purge them and to make them white even to the end of time because it is yet for an appointed time. So you can see that there's Daniel's verbiage is time, at, at that time, and the time that he's referring to in the 12th chapter has much to do with the separation of the final seven years here. And I know that's weird, but if you're not familiar with the teaching on Revelation, when he talks about time, times, and a half, those are actually explaining terms of counting or reckoning time, that specific statement of times, for time, times, and a half is actually three and a half years. If you're not familiar with that, we'll talk about that in another time. But what I'm trying to say is that Daniel is, in the 12th chapter, he's talking about something at that time shall Michael stand up that is future time. And we know that Michael appears many times, specifically the mention of Michael in Jude 9 and the mention of Michael in, I think, two other uh, scriptural references that make it abundantly clear that this particular thing that is being spoken of, future time, not something where people will be delivered in Daniel's time, future time, and there's something that's said here. Again, it's mind-boggling. If you, if you read the Old and New Testament, what I'm going to read, I think, is mind-boggling. Verse 2, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Hello. What do you think that means? Many that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So it tells you with absolute certainty. Now, we've seen this multiple times already. Uh, if, if I would have taught the lesson I intended to teach out of Job, Job talks about how his flesh may decay, but he knows he will stand and he will see the Redeemer. And he says, I know my Redeemer lives at the end of days. I know I shall stand and I shall behold him. So when you read, and we're talking about different writers. Now, somebody out there who really doesn't have a gestalt of the Bible will say, oh, come on. You know, it's just a bunch of made-up stuff. It's stuff that people wrote, and it's so long ago. And I, I'm thinking to myself, if you want to believe that, knock yourself out. But I'm going to take every piece of information in here and take it as if it is absolutely, unequivocally true. See, when you study this book, without asking for a sign, and you come to the faith without asking for anything else except what's in here. And years later, and this is my case, years later, I'm huge into bi biblical archaeology. So every month I get reviews and I get papers from the latest digs that are only confirming now, not 10 years ago, not 20 years ago, but now, like in the last year or two, places in the Bible that we thought and many scholars for sure thought never existed, it's a made-up name, it's not a place. Well, we're now finding out that certain geographical places that are in this book that people said doesn't exist actually existed from these digs that either by way of uncovering signets or whatever information is being gleaned out of the ground. But that's not, my faith is not hinged on that. My faith is hinged on what's in this book. But when things are coming out much later, confirming what we've already read, Somebody might say, well, you believe this? Well, when you have the merging of multiple pieces of information and multiple writers writing hundreds of years apart confirming each other, I think I'm standing on pretty solid ground here. So with that being said, I want to talk about something interesting. This is what blows my mind. When, when Daniel uses the term, and many of them that sleep in the dust, if you read your Bible, you're going to read many times, both old and new, and they slept referring to those that died. Are you familiar with what I'm saying? The verses that sleep in the Bible. Don't you think it's, it's mind-boggling to me? Now, in the backdrop of what we're looking at, sleep is temporary. Sleep is, you don't sleep indefinitely. You know, you go to bed, right? And you wake up, that's sleep. It's, 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 it's a break from wake, right? But it's temporary. 
Don't you think it's crazy that through and through this book, the concept of sleep and rest, sleeping, 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 referring to the dead, has been telling us all along that sleeping is temporary. We get the idea when we say rest in peace, that person is now resting forever. Sleep is temporary. This is what I've been trying to tell you, even when I, sorry, I get a little animated because it's mind-boggling to me that Daniel would write, Daniel would write, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake and goes immediately into some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt or punishment. Don't you think, uh, here's a young man who obviously loved the Lord, prayed multiple times a day, and for whatever, we know that there might have minimally been a form of a Pentateuch or some book that was read and distributed as well as oral tradition, it's still mind-boggling to me that this one verse, verse 2, I'm not done, but this verse 2, is telling us something that we should all just kind of take note of. Even the people who say, but I'm still not clear about death, dying, heaven, and hell. Well, you can be clear about this. Any mention of sleep. Remember when Paul says regarding the 500 brethren at once, and some are asleep now. Don't you think it's kind of mind-boggling they use the word sleep? They don't say some are dead now. And don't think they use that expression to be poetic. It's one of the few times in the King James Bible where they actually got a concept right. Wow, sleep is temporary. Okay, verse 3 continues on. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. But thou, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the end of time. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood two, other, stood other two, one on this side of the bank of the river and the other on the other side of the bank of the river. And one said to the man clothed in linen which was upon the waters of, of the river, How long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen which was upon the waters of the river when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven and swear by him that liveth forever that it shall be for a time, times and a half. That is three and a half years. We're talking about the end, the last seven years, sounds a little uh, final. That's because it is. It's referring, referencing the last period of time to be chronicled on earth. And then it says, and when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. And I heard, but I understood not. Then I said, oh, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the end of time. Now, if you read on the last three or so verses, maybe 10, well, 10 through 13 here. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand 290 days. These are repeated figures that have to do with prophecy. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and thirty-five days. But go thou thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. And you notice it doesn't say here, go your way, like maybe it was said to Abraham, live your long life and you'll go to the sepulcher and you'll... It's not saying that here. There's been a shift in holy inspiration or holy writing that is now it was given to Daniel to kind of lay out something for the end of days. The reason why I, I'm stopping on Daniel and saying, Let, let's not pass over this too fast. It brings up several important things that we need to be absolutely clear on. The first one brings me back to my most favorite subject, which is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. See, I'm reading this and it just leaps out at me so crystal clear. Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. This concept that is not just here in Daniel, as I mentioned Job, as I mentioned Psalm 16 and Psalm 17, there is references out of Psalm 76, and possibly I think 77 is the one I'm thinking of, but at least many times over in the Old Testament where we're reading these concepts, now we begin to form doctrine. So sleep in the Bible must be understood. It may at times refer to someone who has died, 
But remember, even in the New Testament, when it says the girl is, I think they say it, King James says, the maiden is asleep, referencing she's, they meant it, she's dead. No, she's not. And then, of course, she's raised up. So it's important for us to grab hold of some of these words and recognize that even in a writing that is, say, some 500 years before Christ, it's revealing a promise of resurrection. It is revealing a promise of a risen Savior in front of whom thousands of thousands of thousands will worship. It is revealing something to us about the fact that when we die, that state that we reside in here is temporary. Now, I don't want to get into the details like somebody was talking about. I can't remember who it was telling the story of, oh, I now remember. It was somebody telling the story of their pet. Wow, this is a good one, and it's kind of weird. Uh, their, their beloved little chihuahua died many years ago, and they didn't want to part with the chihuahua, so they put it in a box. And I guess they wrapped it up in tape, and they put it on, their, on top of their fireplace. And many years later, they had another small dog and it died too and they wanted to put that dog in the box with the other dog yeah thank you so I, when I heard the story I just felt exactly like that and I was thinking Lord when you resurrect these small little precious things maybe you can give them giant teeth to go and attack that guy but um, he said he opened the box and the first chihuahua wasn't there it was gone and that is the principle of what happens when things decay over time that is kind of the understanding we should have that temporary state of sleep. Now, we're not going to be put in a box like the Chihuahua, but it's to, it's to explain that even the state of the body in its, in its state in, that it's buried in is temporary. It's all temporary until something that is absolutely permanent and forever occurs. So I'm going to ask you this question. I'm going to step away from the lectern. I'm going to ask you a question. If what I've been laying out for the last several weeks is true, which I believe the Bible is true, then it tells me something. All of the time that I have here, and I've referenced this before, but I'm going to say it again, all the time we have here is preparation for eternity. All of it. You get up until the point where something in your mind clicks and you go, oh, that's what I'm supposed to be doing down here. And all the time that I wasted and all the stupid stuff and all the idiocies that I did, a light goes on. Okay, I've got so many years ahead of me, and I guess this is, this is what God intends for the time that's left. Now that my eyes are open, my understanding's a little bit clearer, because everything that I'm learning here will not just be, I learned it here, and I take it to the grave with me, and it's end of story, but rather, everything that I'm learning here, specifically about the most important thing that you could ever learn about, the one you're going to spend eternity with, that information does not stay in the grave. That body stays in the grave, but the information gleaned stays with the soul and is gone with the soul and the spirit to be in the presence of God. So when we talk about understanding, like almost digging into this, it says volumes that we should not. When we think of death and dying, we think of our departed loved ones. Somebody said, you don't understand. My husband just died last month. So somebody just wrote me a letter and said, my husband died last month. And it's, it's just been terrible for me. I just can't sleep. I can't eat. And I'm reading the letter thinking, well, obviously, this person doesn't know that I went through that some 15 years ago. And I know what that's like. And I've had many people close to me. That starts the process of thinking. The questions we should all be asking. Why am I here? What is this life about? Is there something that I'm missing in the big picture to understand what I have to do to be there with him versus some other place? These are the purpose, this is the driving force of reaching into this book and saying, if I can get it clear before I even hit the New Testament, because in the New Testament, there are less allegorical or metaphorical, there are less poetic prose of prophecy and more specific statements that will not just give clarity to the Old Testament. It will take what was a shadow, just a shadow, and bring it into the reality of what is, where we could only see in the Old Testament. And there's a pretty good outline right here in the 12th chapter, but it's still just a shadow. And when the real substance appears, which is Christ, and he reveals to us, to his disciples and to us, the reality, when he says, before Abraham was, I was, and he clearly says he saw Satan fall, the one who was from the beginning of time, which is why John opens his gospel with saying, in the beginning was the Word. He's referencing Christ, who's seen everything, knows the plan of the Father.
for humanity. And we're kind of hard in our ability to open up and let this word come in because this word tells me those that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, which brings me back to resurrection. And if he is the first goer, which the Bible says he's the first of, of its, I hate to use the word it because he is he and not it, but the first of its kind in terms of a resurrected individual, and we shall follow him. Why, for a second, should we be sad when we think about a terminus down here? See, it's when you start to shift gears and start understanding what God has laid out. If, if the resurrection is true, then why are we so worried? If the resurrection is true, why do we walk around box after box of Kleenex when somebody dies? I understand missing somebody. Don't get me wrong. I'm not a stoic. But if we really understand this and we really know my destiny is, my ultimate the terminus for me, where I'm going. Well, Pastor Scott, how do you know that? You don't, you, don't, you don't have a crystal ball. No, I don't. I have a Bible. Much better than a crystal ball. And my Bible tells me something very, very simple. All of these people out there in uh, television insanity Christianity world, I don't know, I wanted to make up another word, but it sounded too close to another bad word, so I just said five different words to explain what I meant. But I don't get the idea or I don't get the feeling or the understanding that the vast majority of these people are interested in telling people the reality. And the reality is the morticians, the, the funeral homes, they've convinced us of something. It's the end. Spend and buy the best coffin you can with the most bells and whistles on it and get the most of everything that you can because your loved one would have wanted that. If you've, if you've been through this, you know how terrible it is that you, you're basically getting duped in your grief. But the reality is, and this is the reality, I, I always make my little two cents worth of this. The box you're placed in is not going to matter. You know why? Because eventually, whether you are raised out of that box or whether you're given a complete new celestial garb to wear, the box doesn't mean a damn thing. It just makes more money and commission for the person who's selling it to you. I'm, I'm a realist. I'm, I'm not trying to tell people don't do something nice, but be real about something. If you're coming back here, and you know you're coming back here, and you're clear about coming back here, I'm not sure why you'd waste time on certain things that are for people who don't understand, who have not yet been enlightened about what this book says. Now, my last piece of information here is that probably next week we will reach into the New Testament with substantial um, teachings straight from Jesus' mouth to better kind of put flesh and blood on this. But what I want us to take away today, these writers, the psalmist that I referenced, which would, would have been David, but many of the contributors into the Old Testament, and I mentioned something out of Job, they all had insight or revelation into beyond the grave. This is why you're going if to, you, if you're really looking, and if I'm really looking, we're going to find out that none of these had the outlook. Not one of them had the outlook of when the grave is closed, it's over. There was always some line, one verse, one statement that projected something into the future about the state of that individual. Somehow, the vast majority of Christians have missed that and spend little or no time studying this subject. Why? Because death comes at the end. Therefore, why even bother thinking about it? But I want to I think about it and I want you to think about it. Because if we're coming back here, eventually, I have, to, I have to qualify that by saying eventually, then we have to talk about what we will be like. How? How, how will we get to know the direction? Because it says here even, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Well, I've already given you the answer every single week. God does not ask us to be perfect. God doesn't say, if you'll follow the law, if you'll follow these rules, he only asks for one thing. And it's such a simple, simple thing that most people will completely miss this and say, well, there's too many rules and there's too many regulations for me to be a Christian, so I'm not going to be one. I don't know what Bible or what book you're reading or who you're listening to, but Jesus asks you for one thing. Trust him. Don't trust me. Trust him. Don't take my word. Take his, the word that spoke, that could tell us everything we need to know about God, who came in the flesh, who revealed himself to us, as essentially a slice of God meeting 
the body of a man walking the face of the earth, performing many miracles to say, this is what God intended as the roadmap of salvation. Now, if you're interested, I only ask one thing of you. What did he tell his disciples? Did he tell his disciples, don't get married, become celibate, go live in a cloister? Did, did he tell them that? Did he tell his disciples, listen, you can never eat a certain food category. In fact, Jesus prepared food for them, some pretty good food and some pretty good wine. So all those abstainers out there that have issues with Jesus didn't have a problem. They called him a wine bibber and a glutton. So it tells you that he enjoyed his food. And by the way, just a footnote, an interesting one, I think. You know when Jesus was cooking up that breakfast on the shore in, in John's record? Do you remember that? Well, a lot of people think we won't eat in our new bodies, but we will eat in our new bodies. That opens up a whole different discussion. <laughs> but I want you to think about something. It's what we will eat that might interest you. Okay, you're saying, well, what, what will we eat? Well, uh, tune in next week and I'll tell you. <laughs> you know, you who walk around thinking, oh, right now it's lunchtime and I'm hungry. Tell me what we'll eat next week. That'll give you something to diet for. It's not a live it, it's a diet. All right. Um, so what I want to leave you with, my final thoughts here on what we looked at today is this. Even the Old Testament writers had a clear concept. It's not vague. You don't, you're not reading here. Verse 2 tells you no shadowy, scary underworld of we don't know where these people are going, righteous dead, unrighteous dead. Here's a clear cut. Many will rise up out of the dust of the earth. Some are going in this direction and some are going in that direction, which brings me and poises me in a perfect place to bring you straight into the New Testament next week to talk about what exactly Jesus said regarding these events that happen, that will happen in the future, will certainly happen to us, our loved ones, and we should be concerned and know all that we can about it. So if you'll be here next week, that will be my message, but this is today's message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.